Hello, everyone. It is good to be with you this week. We are continuing in this series that I'm calling Buried Treasure, uh, based on a couple of scriptures from Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 6, uh, uh, some of our main scriptures. Uh, and this week, uh, the we're calling it Heavy Burden or Light Yoke, right? So Buried Treasure, Heavy Burden or Light Yoke. Let's read some scriptures and uh, talk and then we'll pray together. So. Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and he bought that field, right? That is the, that's the idea that we are talking about. Well, part of the idea. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 24, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Those are the ideas. Those, those are the main scriptures that we're talking about. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, but I, I don't, it's not just that. Because that alone couldn't, <laughs> man, that can be difficult. Um, that idea can lead to really struggling to uh, work hard at becoming a, you know, this Christian that you have this idea of making all the sacrifices, uh, um, you know, leaving everything to follow Jesus, which are good biblical teachings, but they can tend to, to lean on works and legalism. And so that's why we are connecting the two ideas. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're connecting that with that, that verse before about the man who finds the treasure hidden in the field and in his joy, he gives up everything to get the treasure hidden in the field. Um, and, and so that's the idea. And um, that's what we're gonna talk about. So let's just pray together and then get into uh, to some of these ideas. So let's pray. Father, thank you that I can be with my friends uh, online and our faith community of those who uh, watch through YouTube, uh, may have got here through Facebook. Uh, Lord, I pray for them and I pray for myself because this is certainly uh, a topic that is a challenge for me. I by no means, I'm not here trying to uh, pretend like I am doing a good job at this. Uh, I'm not. Uh, maybe one of the reasons probably why I'm preaching on this is because the uh, Spirit of the Lord led me to these ideas for dealing with my own life, and I believe it's a problem at large in the church in general, uh, that we are struggling to treasure the kingdom of God and the things uh, of uh, the Spirit. Uh, we are struggling to treasure those things more than all the things uh, uh, that our wealth and our culture can provide for us. There's so many distractions. We have access to, to so much different information and, and hobbies and things that we can purchase uh, uh, and the way we can spend our time and money. Uh, and uh, so we're talking, uh, wanting to have an honest discussion with you, with one another, to look at where we are in this because we want to treasure heaven more than any other thing because it that's important. We pray for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Point number one. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Uh, and, and so I know that you are familiar with uh, this famous passage we're going to talk about. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's famous or if it's infamous. Uh, uh, it is the passage in Joshua 24. Uh, you know, where Joshua challenges the people of Israel. Uh, Joshua 24, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Uh, 
Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors that your ancestors, sorry, I've taken off my watch because it's going to start talking to us in the middle of preaching. Uh, uh, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves uh, this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors uh, uh, that they served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And, you know, that is kind of, uh, uh, you know, the infamous passage, choose this day whom you're going to serve. And I've shared this before in this series. This is kind of a more challenging, more difficult series than I, than I do a lot of times. But I, I, I felt like, you know, that uh, every now and then in between the encouraging series uh, uh, and the encouraging words sometimes you have to do the hard stuff and deal with the difficult stuff and i do feel like this is timely that this is a struggle that we're having uh in the church in our nation uh as american christians culturally uh we i feel like we've lost our way um and you know joshua they're preparing to enter in to the promised land uh and he he you know makes the declaration tells the people of god make a decision who are you going to serve it uh either you're going to serve uh, uh you know the gods of the amorites uh, the the gods uh that, that they worshiped uh, uh beyond the Euph euphrates river in egypt uh, uh, but he says, as for me and my household, we are going to serve the Lord. And uh, that's, you know, I feel like that God is is bringing us to that place. Uh, uh, you know, the church in America, uh, he, he's saying it's time to make up your mind. Who are you going to serve? Uh, are, are you going to serve a, uh are you going to serve me with all of your heart or are you going to live divided? Are you going to have other gods in your life? Are you going to serve, uh, you know, wealth? And we're going to get into that passage here in a second. Uh, but this whole, it made me think about the Catholic Reformation. Um, so in the, you know, late 1400s, early 1500s, and then on through that we have this thing in the church that we refer to as the catholic reformation uh, and we have this problem in history where the church has lost its way uh the the we are now teaching these crazy things the church has now teaching these crazy ideas uh, uh, that they don't come from the Bible. I, you know, I don't know where they come from, probably from the people uh, that are getting all the money. Uh, but the church is teaching crazy things. Uh, for instance, at one of the big problems the church was having uh, is that you could, the church was teaching the people that you could pay the church for the forgiveness of your sins. And the more you paid into the church, uh, the more you could be forgiven of your sins. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the people that were collecting the money didn't know how much you had to pay to receive complete and total forgiveness. Uh, so the idea was the more you paid, the better chance you had at being forgiven. So just keep on paying us. Uh, because, uh, you know, you need a lot of forgiveness. Uh, and, and so the more you paid, the more you'd be forgiven, right? Totally unbiblical, totally crazy, doesn't come anywhere from the scriptures. Uh, but somehow, uh, in the 1500 years since the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, the church had come to this place where they're now teaching the people that they could buy their forgiveness. And not only that, not only were they teaching crazy things they shouldn't be teaching, they had left off teaching the actual truth. It had got lost somehow, whether it was by accident, through neglect, or whether it was on purpose 
through deception, the church had lost track of the greatest foundational, the, the pillar of the teaching that we all know and affirm and believe to be true today, right? Salvation by faith through grace alone. The church had completely lost track of that teaching. They were not teaching the people uh, that, that this is how you get saved. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you ask him to forgive you of your sins. Uh, uh, you accept that by faith. And then in his grace, he, he comes in and changes and transforms your life and does for you what only he can do for you. The church wasn't teaching that. Uh, not only was the church not teaching that truth of salvation by grace through faith alone, but when some people got a hold of the Bible and discovered what was really true and started teaching that truth to the people, those people were uh, put in prison or even worse, uh, they were executed, burned at the stake uh, as heretics for teaching this thing that we all know to be true now and, and totally affirm. Right? Uh, and then think about this. In 1439, the printing press was invented. So in the 1500s, uh, William Tyndale and other people, but William Tyndale, an English uh, man, uh, began translating the New Testament into English. And in 1526, uh, he began printing the Bible in English so common people could have the Word of God and know what the Bible said for themselves. That was in 1526. Well, 10 years later, guess what happened to William Tendell? The church collected him. They put him in jail. They, they put him on trial for a heresy and they found him guilty. And then they executed him and burned him at the stake because he translated the Bible and then started distributing it two people in English so they could read the word of God for themselves and know God for themselves. That's just craziness, right? When you look back at that, you think that that's the craziest thing ever. And you think, surely the church could never repeat those kind of, of stupid mistakes that we've made in the past uh, to do things that are completely obviously wrong or to lose track of things that, that are completely obviously true and correct and right. Uh, uh, but the, so the point I'm trying to get to with all of that is that, that uh, even the most plain, straightforward truths of God's word uh, can be lost when a culture's eyes become unhealthy and we get our eyes set on or fixed on the wrong things. Truth can be lost. It has been in the past, and I believe that uh, uh, as much as the church needed the Catholic Reformation in the 1500s, uh, the church needs a Protestant Reformation in the 2000s. I believe uh, that, that we need a Reformation in the church today just as much as they did 500 years ago. Okay, we are back to it. The church, the Protestant church is back to doing what the Catholic church was doing 500 years ago. We are teaching crazy things. Uh, as crazy as paying for your salvation, right? I, I mean, you have seen the televangelists, and I'm not saying they're all bad. They're not, but there are some bad ones, and you've heard it for yourself, right? If you give me money, uh, then you're going to get money, and the more money you give me, the more money you're going to get from God. What does that sound like, right? That, that's a, that sounds familiar. Uh, uh, you know, here's what I always think is uh, crazy, right? So if there's a guy who believes that if you give money, you'll get money, uh, and the more money you give, the more money you'll get, then why is he asking me to send him my money, and why can't I send him my address, and he sends me his money? Uh, if he really believes uh, that the more you give away, the more you're going to get, then, then why isn't he sending me his money? False teachers and the love of money. That is how the Bible uh, 
The Bible heading for 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 is false teachers and the love of money. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, and malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind, and let's get to it here, who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Uh, so here we are now 500 years after the Catholic Reformation and the church is back to teaching crazy things that Jesus or the Bible never taught. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Jesus taught us the exact opposite. Joshua said, choose ye this day whom you will serve. And Jesus said something very similar in Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, uh, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Uh, the, the Spirit is saying to the church the same thing that Joshua said to the Israelites. Choose who you're going to serve because you can't have it both ways. Let's talk about what Jesus said. Uh, in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? How do we determine if our eyes are healthy or if they are unhealthy? Hebrews chapter 12 teaches us how to figure out if we have healthy eyes. Because if our eyes are unhealthy, we'll be full of darkness. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Uh, where have we fixed our gaze? It is plain. If your eyes are always on Jesus, you will have healthy eyes and you will have healthy desires. Uh, if your eyes are on him, you will have the desires that he has and your desire will be to do his will. How do, you know, how do we answer the question, are my eyes healthy? The answer to that question is, are my eyes on Jesus? and his kingdom and the things of his kingdom that are important to him or are my eyes always on something else uh yeah something else are they on someone else are they uh, are they somewhere else if our eyes are always somewhere else then they will be unhealthy and according to jesus uh, when we have unhealthy eyes our lives become filled with darkness. We, we want to treasure the things of the kingdom of heaven because when we treasure the things of the earth, when we get our eyes fixed uh, on our money, on our position, uh, on our geography, on our uh, relationships, when our eyes are fixed on things other than the Savior and His saving work and His saving grace, our eyes become dark and our lives become filled with darkness. 
No one can serve two masters. Verse 24. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We cannot serve both God and money. We can try. Uh, I certainly have tried. You know, when I was praying together with you, uh, I admitted this is something that I struggle with. I'm not doing it a very good job of treasuring the kingdom of heaven more than the kingdom of earth. Uh, I do feel like I have uh, other little G gods uh, that I'm battling in my life that are distracting me from serving the, uh, the capital G God that I want to devote my whole life and, and concern and passion and uh, energy to. Uh, you cannot serve both God and money. We can try. I've tried. Uh, but I have tried long enough now. And I've tried hard enough now to finally concede uh, that Jesus really does know what he's talking about. Right? Uh, I, I'm, I am fine. I've been doing this long enough now to finally concede. I have been arm wrestling with Jesus about this idea for a long time. I thought, you know what, Lord, just let me try and prove you wrong. I can show you that I can have one foot over here uh, in the world and one foot over here in your kingdom, that I could still have these other loves over here, but still love you more than them. Uh, and I have come to the conclusion, you know, uh, in these last uh, seven uh, years or whenever you know, I, I got old enough to know it doesn't work No matter how hard you try you can never try hard enough You cannot hold the hand of the world and uh, hold the hand of Jesus in the other hand Choose you this day whom you will serve we have choices to make about our lives uh, Psalms 25 15 my eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Only he can do it, uh, and so I want him uh, to have uh, the gaze of my eyes. Uh, I want to look on him and the splendor of his beauty, and I want to delight in him uh, more than any other thing, because I have tasted and seen that he is good. Amen? So, uh, second point and last point. Uh, uh, if our treasure is a burden, then we've got a problem on our hands. If our treasure is a burden, then we have got a problem on our hands. Uh, we have been talking about this, uh, and I want to keep talking about it throughout the series. Uh, uh, because uh, of this idea, I want this series to accomplish what I believe the Lord set out uh, for the series to accomplish. Uh, and uh, what, what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to accomplish is... Uh, uh, is that in our joy, we would sell everything that we have and we would buy that plot of ground that has the buried treasure on it and we would make it ours, that it would be in our joy, that it would not be this burden, that, that we would not talk about this idea of treasuring the kingdom of heaven. And when we finish the series, leave off the series feeling worse than when we started because that is a very real possibility. We, we're talking about some uh, very hard sayings of Jesus. We're talking about some things that are very difficult to, uh, to strive for, to obtain, to live up to. And so we could leave the series feeling like a we failed. Like, I can't do these things. I can't treasure uh, the Lord more than any other thing. I can't leave my mother and father and, and sons and daughters and, and make him more than any other thing. I can't do that. I guess I've fallen short. Uh, I guess I'll never be uh, the, the Christian that God wants me to be. That's not uh, how I want us to finish up this series. But, but that is a possibility because there are 
some hard sayings. Jesus said some hard things. Let's not pretend that like Jesus didn't say things that we find difficult. John chapter 6, right? John chapter 6. In his lifetime, Jesus said things so difficult uh, uh, that people couldn't even believe him. In John chapter 6, when he, he talks about being the bread that came down from heaven, this is when he has, you know, one of these moments. Uh, he's teaching the people that they're following him. Uh, he's, uh, you know, fed uh, the multitudes. Uh, they've had bread and fish. Uh, but now Jesus kind of changes directions and he tells the people, I am the bread of life. He says, you have to uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And what do the people say? On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching who can accept it. Jesus had hard teachings. Jesus said things that were hard to understand. Uh, Jesus said things that offended people, right? In this passage, he asked them, does this offend you? And it did. They were offended. The passage tells us uh, that, that from that time on, many people left him and stopped following him. Because he had this hard teaching. And that is what, you know, why we are going to continue to talk about this idea. Because if we don't get a hold of the, the certain aspect of grace that enables us to do what we're talking about, then this idea of treasuring the kingdom of heaven more than any other thing, instead of being a light and easy yoke, the way Jesus intended to be, it can become a heavy burden that crushes down on us, right? Uh, and so that's what I want to be careful doesn't happen. Um, I, we want to talk about treasuring the kingdom of heaven more than treasuring our own lives, choosing this day whom we'll serve, but we want that treasure to be in our joy, that the grace of God comes in and fills us and enables us, empowers us, so that it is not our striving uh, and sacrificing and trying harder and working more and doing better, uh, that we finally work our way into treasuring him more, uh, but it's by surrendering, by letting go, uh, and by inviting God's grace to come in and make me who I know that I'm not. Right? Uh, I know I'm struggling with this thing of, of uh, sacrificing it and giving it. Let's look at some of the other hard things that Jesus said. Uh, just to, to, you know, to understand uh, this idea of treasuring him and, uh, and how difficult it can be for us, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 10. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me and whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it jesus is talking about treasuring him more than any other thing and he says some very hard things that i feel like the church is just pretending like Jesus never, like we never heard Jesus say that. I feel like the church is just that we're reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're just cherry picking out all of the uh, the good and great promises that we like so much. And then we come to passages like Matthew chapter ten, where Jesus tells us if we really treasure Him, that means we love Him more than I love my own dad, more than I love my own mom more than I love my own children, more than I love my own life. And that is a hard saying, uh, because I don't know how you feel about that, 
but I don't feel like I measure up to what it is that Jesus is asking of me in that passage. And, and he says something similar uh, that I want to read. It's different enough that I want to read this passage as well, okay? Uh, it's Luke chapter 14. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now that is a hard saying. And we are, you know, this final point is, uh, uh, if, if, if the treasure is a burden, then maybe we're doing something wrong. Okay, Jesus continued. Suppose one of you wants to, to build a tower. Won't he first sit down and count the cost to see if he has what it takes to finish what he started? Do, do I have what it takes to finish what I've started? Right? I, I have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ and I want to treasure him more than I treasure any other thing in life because I love him, but also because we're reading these hard sayings and he instructs me that if I don't carry my cross and follow him, I cannot be his disciple. So what are we going to do? Uh, to me, these hard sayings of Jesus are very plain and very straightforward. We, you know, we can't go about uh, saying, oh, well, Jesus, you know, he said this, but what he really meant by this uh, is this other thing over here. Now, I know uh, you may be able to find some passages uh, where you can kind of dance around what Jesus said and what Jesus meant, you know. Uh, I don't think you can do that with these. I, I don't know you know, if you could say it any more plain and simple, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's pretty straightforward. Jesus says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. To think that Jesus said that I could live my life in such a way, right, that if you sprinkled it on manure, I wouldn't even improve that. That's a hard saying, right? That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus just said. He, he said, it, you're supposed to be salt, uh, but if the salt has lost its flavor, it's not even fit to sprinkle on the manure pile. That's what Jesus said about me when I don't treasure him more than any other thing that I, I've lost the salt and that I have the, I don't have the flavor of having a relationship with the son of God. The, the hard teachings of Jesus can make us feel like it would be impossible to ever measure up to this idea of treasuring him more than any other thing. Uh, but thankfully not all of Jesus teachings were hard teachings. Uh, uh, some of Jesus' teachings were very easy to embrace teachings. And what I think uh, the key to this is, uh, is that we have to marry the hard teachings uh, and the easy teachings to one another to actually understand how it is we can measure up to this ideal that seems impossible to measure up to. And so let's look at one of the easy teachings of Jesus. In my opinion, the easiest teaching. So a teaching that I absolutely love. I read it uh, and it just takes 10,000 pounds off my shoulders. It's Matthew chapter 11. Normally I just read verses 28 through 30, but I, I want to read a little bit more. Uh, 25 through 30. Because I saw a little something in there that, that blessed me and I think it will bless you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and you have revealed them to little children. Right? That, that's just, I, I, sometimes I forget 
that little section is in there because I get so focused on verses 28 through 30, I'm going to read, that I just love so much, but I forget um, that I know the Son of God and you know the Son of God because He's revealed it to little children, right? Uh, you know, there's times when we feel, well, at least I do, uh, you know, I look at my life and I feel like, you know, God, I love you so much. Uh, you've done so much for me. I've done so little for you. Uh, I, I just wish I could measure up to, uh, to being the man of God that I, would, that I would like to be to honor you in your name and to bring glory to you. But I've just, I've failed so many times and uh, fumbled so many times and fallen in the dust. Uh, and yet we read here that, that he, he hid it from the wise and learned, so instead he could reveal it to us, his little children, right? Uh, that, that for whatever reason, God in his grace uh, has looked down on us uh, and had mercy on us uh, uh, and said, I love these people, right? Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why he would love me, but he loves me, and, and I'm the little child that he has made a decision to reveal his truth in me, and you are too. Jesus continues, Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him the father has cho has chosen let, let me sorry let me say it again the son has chosen to reveal himself to us that's what he said right the son chooses to reveal him jesus decided to reveal his father to us and then of course uh, verses 28 29 and 30 this this is uh, the uh, the meat of this section right here. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus just, he just turns everything upside down. He turns everything on its head. I, I mean, you know, we were just talking about in the hard teachings of Jesus that unless I give up everything and follow him, and unless I carry my cross and follow him, I cannot be his disciple. But now here, Jesus turns that all upside down, uh, and he tells me that his yoke is easy and that his burden is light. And then if you look back at our our the foundational scripture for this series, Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. So here we find Jesus actually marrying the two ideas uh, that seem so different from one another. Uh, and Jesus marries them together to one another, right? It's taking everything you have uh, and then selling it for the sake of the kingdom. But it's also uh, the, the light, easy yoke uh, of Jesus because we do it in our joy. And, and this is the key, right? What, in Matthew 13, 44, you have this man who is giving up everything he has so he can buy a field with the treasure in it. And this is the key. How can we give up everything and yet do that in our joy? How can, you know, this idea of, of wanting to treasure the kingdom of heaven more than uh, we treasure our own lives more than we treasure the things are how can we reconcile those hard sayings to Jesus to his teaching that his yoke is easy and his burden is light if I have to give up my life to become his disciple and and a follower of him and this is the key to that uh, I'm giving up everything I have to buy the field 
but I know that in the field there is a treasure hidden in there that is more valuable than anything I ever had. And not only is it more valuable than anything I ever had, it is uh, 10,000 times uh, more valuable than anything I've ever, it, it's a million times, it's a million billion times, right? Uh, uh, the way that I can love Jesus and treasure his kingdom and give everything, uh, the way that that happens in my joy is that I know that by obtaining him, yes, I'm giving up what I have, but, but I don't really have anything, uh, right? I remember the life I lived before I, I knew Jesus. I got saved when I was 19 years old, so it wasn't very long, but uh, I mean, I remember the life I had without him, and it was a miserable life. It was empty, devoid of meaning. And, and uh, the, there was nothing that I had uh, that, that I couldn't give up to get this thing that's so much better. Right? We're, we're giving up what we have, but we're gaining a treasure that's greater than anything we could ever have. And, and that's how we reconcile the hard teachings of Jesus with the light burden that he promised, right? Uh, we're giving up everything we have, but in doing so, we are gaining everything Jesus has. And that is a trade that I can make in my joy, that I would give up my life so I can get everything that he has. That's something I can do with joy. And I believe that this is one of the key teachings if this series is going to be successful uh, in accomplishing what the Holy Spirit wants to accomplish in us. Uh, and I want to go back to John 6, verse 65. This part is key. Um, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Right, so it's the only possible solution for reconciling the very difficult teachings of Jesus, which he commands us to give up everything in life that we love and hold dear, uh, to the easy teaching of Jesus that very plainly says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The only way to reconcile that is to cling to John 6.65 and promises similar to it, uh, uh, in which Jesus promised that the Father would enable us to love him more than any other thing. Our hope of treasuring him and his kingdom more than treasuring ourselves and our kingdom is in asking him to enable us. God, give me the power to do what I can't do on my own. We will be miserable Christians if we seek to treasure him by just trying harder than we've ever tried before. If that's the way we're going to go about this thing, uh, we are going to be the most unhappy people in the church. We have to be enabled. I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. We have to be enabled to treasure God by God through God's grace towards us. Uh, John Piper, by his grace, for his name, through the obedience of faith, he wrote this in that article, okay? This is why Romans 4.16 says, For this reason, being an heir of the promise, is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. This is Paul's way of saying that grace is absolutely free and cannot be deserved or merited by us. When grace comes to us, it is through faith or it does not come at all. Grace has power on its own of its own. You do not work it up. 
Grace is not just forgiveness of our sin and mercy on our misery. It is also a divine power that comes to us through Jesus absolutely freely for the sake of treasuring him more than any other earthly treasure. Amen and amen. It has got to be by grace. Amen. Sorry, I want to see uh, my one of something in my notes right here. Um, if our treasure is a burden, then we've got a problem on our hands, right? It's not supposed to be a burden. And the way that it becomes a light and easy yoke is by our Father in heaven enabling us to come to this place by his grace. Thank God for that. Uh, I pray that uh, you will be able to treasure the Lord. And I want you to pray for me that uh, my treasure will be in heaven and not on earth. Uh, and we'll spend this week praying for one another. And I'll see you next week. Amen. God bless you.